So great to be back here, and you guys have blessed me so much with just the privilege of coming and feeding you the Word of God. And I just want to know, who in this room believes with me that Jesus is better? Amen, amen. I, just, I have just a burning passion in my heart that we would slay the lies of the evil one over our destinies tonight. And we would be women who take up that word and we would believe, and we would believe one thing, that the call of God, the destiny of God, the purpose of God for our life, that Jesus is better and that we would not settle, that we would not detour and we would not take less from this life than what he has for us. And so ladies, I invite you right now, I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to pray with me, pray for yourself. And we have just invited the Holy Spirit here and we believe by faith that he is. So let's go before the Lord now and invite him to speak to us, to redirect us, to woo us, to love us, and to remind us, some of us, of callings and destinies that he's whispered long ago that maybe we've put on the shelf. Let's go before him in prayer. Father God, I praise your name and I praise you, God, for your son who redeemed us, who captured our hearts, who we can say Jesus is better. And God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, who is our power, who is our strength. When we look at ourselves and we see defeat, we look at ourselves and we see hopelessness, God, we can look, we can lift up our eyes and we can see our God who is almighty. And Father, we come this great gathering, this great gathering tonight, God. And we just say, in Jesus' name, bind our enemy who does not want us to hear this word. Bind him from this place. In Jesus' name, we command you to flee. And we pray that our minds would be teachable, our ears would be open, and our hearts would receive, God, the word that you have for us. And we pray all of this in the most powerful name, the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I just about jumped out of my chair when I got an email from Debbie Stewart about two months ago with uh, the topic that she had given me, and I immediately started responding back, oh my goodness, all capital letters, you have no idea how much this has been on my heart. And it just shows to me how much God has bathed this weekend in prayer. Thank you for the team that has been praying, because God moves through your prayers. And how much the Holy Spirit has an agenda that is greater than Debbie, that's greater than any speaker. The Holy Spirit has an agenda because I truly believe with everything in my being that every one of you in this room, you are called. You have a destiny. And what we say, what we mean when we say the word destiny, I don't want to miss this, is that God has purposed your life. You are not accidental. Who you are, how you're crafted, how you're created, and how you're positioned. That the God of the universe says, I have called her for myself for this time for a reason. But what I want you to know is that there is an enemy of our souls. And I get a a hard but needed task tonight. That I want us to know, the Lord wants us to know, that the enemy of our souls has an agenda against your destiny. He is not going to sit passively and wait and watch you fulfill your God-given gifts and glory. Some of you already know this well. You already know this. Well, let me back up and tell you a little bit about myself. Hi, my name is Marion, by the way. Stranger, some of you. And I I'm, I'm live in Houston. And if you've ever been in Houston, you cute little Dallas people, you think you have traffic, don't you? Y'all are so cute, you know, all of these suburbs where everybody, we just all congregate together on one freeway in Houston, it's real fun. Um, so yeah, Houston, we know something about traffic, and God likes to work on our patience, you know, I think that's what it is, and it, one particular day, I was hosting probably my 10,000th bridal shower that I was hosting. And um, I was late to said bridal shower, and I was in the car, and it became one of those storms that we like to have that just come up out of the Gulf, they come out of nowhere, and all of a sudden traffic just comes to a dead, still stop. 
and I pull onto the freeway, I've got 10 minutes to be there, and all I can see are red lights in front of me, cars as far as the eye can see. And so as I pull in to my little spot where I might as well put in gear and park, all of a sudden that little tension starts rising up in me. You know, that little turmoil that starts to a boil and it just gets a little hotter and a little hotter and a little hotter. And I feel it kind of roaring up in me because I am tired of waiting. I've got to get there. I have a place to be. I've got somewhere to go. And I am sick and tired of waiting. Pause. Just in case you want to know a little bit something else about me. What was happening And that physical situation right then was all too familiar to how I felt in my emotional life. It was way too familiar. And because I got in that car and I was waiting, I wanted to scream, and I probably did, at God, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of waiting. Because in my life, I was now 36 and single, and it had gotten old real quick. And I was real over it. And it seemed like God had brought his destiny for everyone else but me, or so I thought. I thought God had been doling out destinies like this, and I was like, oh, wait, give me one, give me one, and he'd given it to everybody else. And I was the little kid that forgot to come to supper. And so as the enemy began to torment and to lie, I began to be a person who did not like waiting very much. It began to be a point of contention. It began to be a point of pain. And it began to feel like God had forgotten me and God had abandoned me. And so any sense of waiting stirred this feeling in my heart. Oh, and P.S., I was hosting a bridal shower for my best friend, hallelujah, and um, I had just gone through this um, really devastating breakup with the man that I had planned the big wedding with, and I thought, this is my destiny, this is what God has for me, until he walked out the door and married someone else a few months later. So I was a real happy camper, sitting there in traffic. And so I'm sitting there in traffic, and I see a sea of cars in front of me, and I think to myself, self, let's take control of this. You know that that moment in life where I've got a plan, God, you're not acting, I'm going to fix this. You know that fix this thing? And so I'm going to fix this. I look to my right. There's one little lane of cars here, and between me and this luxurious feeder road, there's no cars on it. There aren't any cars there, and they're just whipping by, going to their destinations and their destinies like frolicking show-offs, I'm telling you. They're just showing off over there. Between me and this beautiful, empty feeder road was this pesky little I don't know, construction zone. I mean, you know, they had got I-10 down to like two lanes, whatever. And they like had a few of these little orange cones that said, don't drive here. And a few of those barrels blockading it. But I thought to self, self, right? I'm, I'm smarter than the orange cone. I have an SUV. I'm a Texan. This is our God-given destiny, right? So I took my gas guzzling Texan car and I just scoot on over. Hi little trucker! And I scoot on over and I find this space between these two orange cones and I hit the gas like you wouldn't believe. And I get about halfway into this beautiful little construction zone that was my path to freedom when my wheels started going. Who in the house knows what I'm talking about? I know there's one of these Texas girls that have been mud hogging over here. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? I am now sinking as deep in mud as I possibly can imagine. I am dressed in pastel. I have heels on. And I am now sinking into mud. And I began to throw my hands on the steering wheel. I was like, are you laughing at me? But, as Debbie wisely said earlier, I'm the one who got myself there. I'm the one who ignored the big orange cone 
and probably plowed over the barrel. And the man waving like this, <laughs> they said, do not come here. Because I wanted it. And I thought I was smarter. And I thought it was okay. And I reasoned and I justified and I believed that it was no big deal. Ladies, I here, I'm here tonight to talk about one thing. It's the name of our talk tonight is Crooked Thinking on the Straight Path. And that crooked thinking is what I want to talk about. It's these detours that come across our path in life where we're sailing down the road that the Lord has called us to as his daughters, as followers of Jesus. Where we're following him and all of a sudden we're either waiting, something's not going according to the plan, we can't see around the bend, we don't know what to expect, and all of a sudden there is this detour. And it sure looks awesome. And we think, self, you know you do it. I think I'll take that. Well, I want to back up and talk a little bit. And if you will look in your notes, I want to talk a little bit about this path. You will notice in your note there's a diagram. And I want to just kind of clarify just some theology for us so none of us are confused and don't walk out of here thinking, A, that Marion girl, she's from Houston, so we can't trust her anyway. She said that we could lose our salvation. Repeat after me. Marion never said you could lose your salvation. Awesome. I appreciate your cooperation. I don't want there to be any confusion about what I mean when I say a detour because I don't want the enemy later to come back and twist this in any way. So I want to stop and make sure we all have some clarification. Now let's look at this diagram. I want to start by looking at Matthew 7, where Jesus gives us an instruction. He gives us a teaching about the kingdom of God. And if you're a daughter of God, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are now a citizen of the kingdom. And Jesus says this. He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it, for the gate is small, and the way is narrow. Everyone say narrow. That leads to life, and there are few who find it. Now, I want to compare these two roads. We have a broad way, wide, broad way that leads where? destruction. Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. Jesus um, also described this word as destruction, and if you look that word up in the Greek, it just gives me chills. It says the loss of what might have been. I want to let that just sink into your heart for a minute. It's the loss of what might have been. Now, Jesus says, at some point, we were all on this path of destruction. And at some point, we recognize, hey, I'm a sinner, I need help, and we turn to Jesus, we cried out to God, by faith, we receive salvation, and the scripture, all of the scripture basically shows us that we turn from living on this way, the broad way, the way of destruction, the way of death, to the way of life. And Jesus calls it the abundant life, and it's a narrow road. And it's a narrow road where we are following Christ, we're walking with him, and we have his life in us. We're saved. We have the gift of God of salvation, but we also have the Holy Spirit, and it's a way of following Jesus. Now, detours. Debbie mentioned in her talk, and it's right there in your handout, the words of Christ in John 10.10. Jesus said, the thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's the path of destruction. That's the way that leads to death. That's the agenda. Everyone say agenda. That's the agenda of the evil one. And Jesus says, but I, I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. 
So as we're looking at what are these detours, what is this thing, uh, what I want you to get in your heart right now is that God has a destiny for you. The Word of God says that abundant life is our right as children of God. That is our inheritance. The Word of God teaches us that we should have joy, we should have life, we should have peace, that the rest of the world cannot comprehend because that is not the inheritance and destruction. But just because we're on the narrow way does not mean the thief does not want to lead us down detours, to lead us down ways that are going to take us away from what God has us. He has an agenda. He has an agenda. I want to review that agenda with you for just a second so we can be really clear. I don't want to spend too much time with him because he does not deserve it because he is defeated. Amen? Amen. And the only thing he can do to us is lie and deceive us. But we have to be aware of his schemes and tactics. We have to be aware of how he operates so that we can stay on that life of abundance and be women who fulfill our destiny. Now, um, this is not on your notes, but I want you to be aware that the schemes of the enemy, his agenda, number one, he wants to deceive you about his power. Not that you would think he's less strong. Oh no, he wants you to think he's stronger than he is. He's toothless. Our enemy is defeated at the cross. And it's better that we know that because when his schemes and tactics come, we have to know who we are and whose we are and the resources and the arsenal that the God Almighty of the universe has given us because destiny is our inheritance. But he wants to lie to you about that. The second thing, he wants to deprive you of your privileges as a child of God. The word of God is, and we're going to look at this in a minute, that in your inheritance as a child of God, you've been given supernatural power. You've been given abilities. And he wants to make sure that you do not pose a threat to his kingdom of darkness. So if he wants you to live in this small shadow of your ability... Some of the ladies in our older generation, God bless you. You are such a gift to the body of Christ. And I want to silence the enemy over you who says that you're expired. It's such a lie from the pit of hell. If I can tell you of the prayer warriors that minister and intercede over evangelistic events that we do, who bring down the gates of hell with their prayers, there is no retirement in the kingdom of God. But the enemy of our souls wants us to believe that we have an expiration date, and it is such a lie. He wants to deprive you. Because you know what? Every person you pray into the kingdom, every person you just love into the kingdom, guess what? When you stand before Jesus, you will receive more awards. You will receive crowns. It doesn't matter if Billy Graham's the one that spoke to him. If you were praying while Billy Graham spoke, you get to join in that inheritance. Don't let the enemy deprive you. Don't let the enemy deceive you. He wants to destroy your effectiveness as a servant of God. I will tell my own personal uh, battle with that in just a minute. And he wants to deny you the rewards God wants to bestow on you in heaven. Your destiny. The Bible says, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard what has never been imagined in the mind of man is what God has planned for those who love him. Ladies, I want you to know those things that you've dreamt about since you were a little girl that, oh, I wish I could do that. Those things that you feel like God has uniquely gifted you. I want you to know that your Father in heaven rejoices over those things. And he wants to see you fully alive. Irenaeus, the great father of the faith, he said, the glory of God is man fully alive. 
Think about that. You fully alive in your personhood and whole and sanctified and living out your abilities and talents, not crouched down in defeat. Not saying, oh, I can't do that, or God's going to call someone else, that that's not me. Who am I to step out? Those things are the enemy who wants to keep you small and limited and defeated. You know why? Because the gates of hell shake when a woman of God rises up and believes that God is in me and God is for me and he has called me. And ladies, I just want to invite you to your destiny. Now, the detours. The detours are specific schemes of the enemy that lead us to destruction. He has no idea he's dealing with the Redeemer that can take anything out of a pit, yours truly. But his schemes are to detour us off the path of the abundant life, not that you lose your salvation. Not that you cease to be a child of God, but that you're living in such a pit of defeat, in a cycle of despair, that you're living in such a place that you're not effective and you're not living out your destiny. Now, I've been praying and asking the Lord, what are the detours that you are tempted with? Because me as a woman back in Houston, two weeks away from marriage, hallelujah, um, my, um, my detours may look different than your detours. But God has been repeating several that I believe are common to us all that keep us from fulfilling the God-given destiny he has for all of us. One that's been continually coming to my heart is the detour of self-hatred. I want you to think about how you think about yourself. I want you to think about the words you speak about yourself. I want you to think about who you're agreeing with about your talent, your potential, your calling, and who you are as a person. I have this dear woman that's in my Bible study class in Houston, and she has been given the absolute gift of hospitality. It oozes out of every pore in her body. She can throw together a women's Bible study, a brunch, a baby shower. She can just do it. And when you're in her presence, you feel the love of Christ and you feel like you know you're face to face with the gift of hospitality because it's effortless. And the Holy Spirit is just so apparent in it. Well, I have a a great relationship with this woman And I posted on Twitter or Facebook something a couple weeks ago because I was about to speak to some college women on rejection. About how the enemy uses rejection and self-hatred. She's 65 years old. She sends me an email about two pages long. And she begins to confess how she stood in the dressing room in Nordstrom last month and wept and wept and wept at the sight of herself. And because of that, she went home, she canceled events, she told her husband to clear their calendar, that she was not going to go out, she was not going to do these things, she was not going to host these things, because she could not stand the 50 pounds that were hanging around her body. And she just began to speak and speak and speak. And it was clear as daylight. The enemy of our souls had gotten her so turned inward and painted these pictures of images and images and images of this is what a woman is supposed to look like. This is what a woman is supposed to look like. And when she didn't measure up to that, the despair, the shame, the self-hatred that came over her, she began to crumple and say, you know what? I'm just not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. You see what he did? He detoured her from using her God-given gift and God-given talent that blesses the body of Christ so immensely by getting her to look at something other than the one who's called her, the one who's gifted her, the one who loves her. You see what he does? 
You see how subtle it is? I was at a Bible study this morning in Highland Park. And this woman began to share some very personal stuff about her life. And she began to speak about herself. Well, I'm not this. I'm not this. I'm no good at this. I'm just such a bad friend. I'm this, this, and this. And I said, stop. For the last five minutes, you've done nothing but agree with the accuser of the brethren. You've agreed and agreed about yourself with the father of lies to where that is how you see yourself and you're aligning yourself with his demonic lies. And in that, in that self-hatred, in that self-focus, in that self-despair, she was missing out, missing out on all that God wanted to do in and through her life. How's self-hatred affecting you? What are you thinking about yourself that is not agreeing with what the, God, the word of God says? How are you agreeing with the evil one? Another detour I think that's very common to us as females is the detour called bitterness. And we're going down the road of life, and all of a sudden, this is not the map I, I, I had out. This is not what I thought was going to happen. It's not supposed to look like this. And the enemy's over here going, oh, come here. I've got something really tasty for you. Why don't you come over here? Why don't you taste this? Oh, yeah. Doesn't that taste good? It's called anger. Doesn't that taste good? It's called bitterness. Oh, you so don't forgive. You so deserve to be mad. And we take that detour when legitimate pain has happened, legitimate hurt, but when we don't respond as Christ would call us to in the narrow way that says, God, this hurts. God, this is painful. This is not what I want. I forgive. God, I release. I surrender. But when we choose to turn down that detour, we become women enslaved who spend years stuck in this thing called bitterness. Sure, you're still a child of God. You're still a woman of God. You may still read your Bible, but you're not fulfilling your destiny. You're not fulfilling the calling that truly, truly only you can fulfill in the kingdom of God. Only you can fill it in the kingdom of God. Another detour of the enemy is when he tries to tempt us. That's what temptation is. It's tempting us to meet legitimate desires in an illegitimate way. And what I call this is a detour of willful sin. It's I want love. I want acceptance. I want these things are legitimate God-given desires. But when he tempts us to meet those in illegitimate ways. And when we do so, when we do so, it's a path called destruction. Ladies, um, our enemy is ruthless. And I have such a, a, a compassion for uh, women. And God made me realize today that it is in the place of your hunger that you're going to be most tempted. We see that in Jesus' life. In Matthew, when Jesus, it says, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was fasting for 40 days, he became hungry. And in that place of hunger, that is when the enemy came. I would say most affairs that have happened by Christian women did not happen by a woman that said, you know what, I think I'm going to cheat on my husband today. No, there was a woman who was feeling empty and lonely, a woman who was hungering for attention and love, and the enemy, he is ruthless. He knows exactly what he's doing, and he will set a detour in a path just like that. I was sitting in Starbucks in College Station this morning, 
and I'm sitting there waiting my coffee, and this man just walks up, you know, and starts, I haven't been flirted with one in a long time, but I remember what it looked like, and I was like, what are you doing? He starts flirting with me, and so I go, like this, you know, it's not that big, but it's obvious, I'm taken, and I, I thought about it just in that split second. This is what happens. This is how he operates. Because if you're hungry enough, you'll take the bait. And so we've got to realize that the detours come in the place of our hunger. You're going to be tempted into a place that you never imagined you would be tempted to go if you buy into the enemy's lies and you take his bait. Francis Frangipane says, each area of our lives that is controlled by sin is an aspect of our soul under deception. Consequently, the more truthful one becomes with himself and God, the more he is delivered from the deceitfulness of sin, Hebrews 3.13, allowing righteousness to come forth. I want to spend the next few minutes just equipping you, equipping you and me to avoid these pits called destruction that come from detours. And I have four words that the Lord has placed on my heart so that we can be women who reach our destiny, do not take the detours, and believe God. Because Jesus is better. And the first word, and I believe all four words are up here, the first word is repent. Everyone say that with me, repent. It's a good old-fashioned church word, but let me illustrate for you what that means. Let's suppose that in your life that you've taken one of these detours. Somehow you have been deceived by the evil one, you've believed the lie, and you found yourself off the narrow way, away from your destiny, away from the abundant life. Let me just rejoice with every person in this room right now that God will take a repentant heart and love it, receive it, restore it, and renew it. Amen? You cannot out the grace of God. Repentance, it means to turn. I don't care how far you've gone off the path. I don't care where that road of destruction has taken to you. At whatever point you turn and say, I am tired of agreeing with the enemy. I am tired of living in his lies. God, I am turning back to you. At that point, you have repented and you are back on the narrow way and the benefits and the blessings of the abundant life are yours again. The word of God tells us is when we repent, the springs of joy rise up in our life. I believe tonight God is calling some of us. You're in a place of defeat. You're in a place that is limiting you from everything that God has for you. And he's just saying, turn back to me. You may be holding on to that bitterness. There may be a willful sin where you said, God, you have not acted on my timetable. I'm going in this way. That may be you. At whatever point you choose to turn back to him, God restores your life. I want you to follow along with me as I read Ephesians. Ephesians 5, verse 6. I wish I had time to read the whole chapter. Um, But Paul has just described the way of destruction. He's just described a life that is outside the will of God. And he says, um, verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 
For the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. A good question to take into your prayer closet is, Jesus, is there anything in my life right now that is not pleasing to you? That, ladies, is a place that we have detoured. When something is in the darkness, it's in our life that does not have the pleasure of God. It can be a practice. It could be a thought pattern. It can be something that is keeping us from our destiny. Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done uh, by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything becomes visible in the light. Do you know what repentance is? Repentance is taking something that's in the darkness, taking it out and turning to Jesus, who is the light of the world, and his light penetrates His light cleanses, his light heals, and we turn back to him. Ladies, repentance does not just happen one time in our story. I think there's a lot of teaching in the church that would say, you got saved and now you're on your way. That's not true. We have to repent daily and repent quickly because the enemy wants us to get entrenched in the darkness and it's instantly come back to the light, come back to the light, bring it to the light. And ladies, let me just love on you from God. He wants to pour out such grace. Don't believe the lie of the enemy that you won't find acceptance there. The unbelievable price of acceptance has already been paid for. It's already there. So the first thing we do is if we want to avoid destruction, we repent quickly. Repent quickly. Everyone say that with me. Repent quickly. The next thing we do is I want to do a little teaching and show you we avoid destruction by learning to rely, to resist the enemy, and to rely on the Holy Spirit. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Peter 5, 8. I've asked my good friend here, Jen Smith. We both grew up in Lufkin. Hi, y'all. Um, I've asked her to come be my assistant. She's not coming to rip me off stage, although you might want her to. Um, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to desire. Everyone say with me. But resist him. Firm in your faith, knowing that the same experience of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in this world. So I want to show you, we have to come up here. I want to give you an illustration of what happens when the enemy comes and he's tempting us to detour. It could be single ladies. It could be sexual sin. Um, Other ladies, it could be sexual sin. I'm just, I'm just uh, <laughs> he's ruthless. I've already said that. Um, it could be any told thing that will keep us from our destiny. It could be turning back to bitterness. It could be gossip. It could be you ruining your reputation by your mouth, whatever it is. Now, Jen's going to uh, illustrate the Holy Spirit. And what I want to be clear is, As a child of God, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. And anywhere we go, any path we take, we are taking the Holy Spirit with us. You're coming with me. You're coming with me. We're taking the Holy Spirit with us. So that means if I'm watching something, the Holy Spirit's watching it with me and maybe getting grieved, okay? The Holy Spirit may get grieved on me. Now, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the power. Everyone say power. I have the power of the Holy Spirit, but I also have this beautiful thing called free will, and I have a chooser. My will chooses. Am I going to follow, listen to, lean on, learn by the Holy Spirit, or am I going to walk in my flesh? Now, the flesh is the old, sinful nature. And when the enemy comes tempting us, what he does is our temptations are like arrows that target our flesh, our desires, our lust, the things that we crave. You, uh, I'm sorry, Oreos are crack. They're just crack. I don't need them. I think I'm allergic to them. But I am an H-E-B, and I'm like, I love you. I love you. You know, it's like it just overwhelms me. 
It's my flesh. And so the Holy Spirit, the Word of God just told us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So in the moment of temptation, I have a choice. Am I going to say, oh, yes, you're right. I'm going here. Or am I going to give my God-given ability by the Holy Spirit to say no? And ladies, we have that option. We have that option. When we resist, what we're doing is we're saying no to the enemy and we're turning and we're relying now on the strength of the Spirit. It's where I say, God, I can't do this. God, I need your power. God, I need you to help me. God, I can't say no to this. Will you help me? And in that place of surrender, you know what the Holy Spirit does? The Holy Spirit says, oh, yes, I can, because I'm the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And you know what the Holy Spirit wants to do? The Holy Spirit, you got to walk this way, Holy Spirit, always wants <laughs> to lead us towards our destiny. The Holy Spirit wants us, and the Holy Spirit may walk us through trials. He walked Jesus into the wilderness, but he's got a purpose there. Holy Spirit, and when we rely and we yield and we use his power instead of our flesh, we will see great and glorious things because here's what the Holy Spirit's role in the Trinity The Holy Spirit is always shining a spotlight on Jesus. The Holy Spirit is always saying, Jesus is better. Say it loud. Jesus is better. Oh, come on, Lufkin, say it louder than that. Jesus is better. The Holy Spirit in you is always going to be making choices and saying, Jesus is better. Jesus is leading me here. I'm going here. This is the way of Jesus. And so because the Holy Spirit will never leave me, I'm always with him. And I have the choice to rely on his strength and rely on his power and go in the way that glorifies the Lord. Thank you. So to avoid destruction, we repent, we resist, and we rely, and we renew our mind, ladies. Romans 12, 2 says, (laughs) that just happened. (laughs) Oh, I was trying to go fast. Um, It says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is that was good, acceptable, and perfect. Okay, now we're about to get real. Can we get real for a second? Um, I think I was naive and believed that the enemy would leave you alone after a while. And when he recognized that you're sold out, he recognized that you love Jesus, he recognized you're living for the kingdom, he would say, okay, I'm going to go move on to my next person. That's not how it works. I was um, months into dating, a good nine months into dating uh, the band I'm about to marry. And I began to sense that we weren't just being tempted. There's a natural progression of intimacy when you love somebody. You know, we had very clear boundaries. We had very, very uh, strict policies concerning alone time and things that we would do together. And um, we were striving after purity, striving after purity because we love God and we want to honor him. And about, you know, a season happened where... I can only describe it as an onslaught on my mind where I began to doubt God's word. I began to doubt God's commands. I began to question, did God really say? Because I love him. Surely that's okay. I, we, we, we're going to get married. Surely it's okay. Every lie of the evil one was unleashed on me. Ladies, I don't know if you know this, but I do evangelistic events on college campuses and teach young women about sex. I know the truth. I know what God's word said. And so I was in my prayer time. I'm like, Lord, what is this? What's going on up here? And by the grace of God, by the sheer power of the Holy Spirit, we did not uh, 
go into the detour. We did not go into destruction. But I knew that this temptation, it's something different. It's bigger. And the Lord opened my eyes and he said, there is a war. Because what is at stake here is not just your purity, but what is at stake here is your destiny. And the enemy understands the quickest way to ruin your ministry and to silence your mouth is to get you into sexual sin. And a minute I understood that, I was like, oh, no, he did not. I'm like, I'm like gloves out fighting. And the Lord said, pick up your sword. Because the battle was going on right here. Right here. I got a three ring little note card thing. And I went through my Bible and I started to write every scripture God said about sex, about the body, about purity, about holiness. And I filled up that sucker. And we were dating long distance. And if I was going to see him, I would drive with this note card holder on my steering wheel. And then God says, let the marriage bed be pure. Let the body be pure. I mean, I am reading your body as a temple of the Holy Spirit. And I am renewing my mind to the word of God because you know what? I am stupid, but I'm not that stupid. God rescued me out of that pit once, and I'm not going back. But I know that my enemy is ruthless, and he would love me to go there. He would love it. But I had to take out my sword and tell him where to go, and I had to renew my mind to truth. And so, lady, I, ladies, I just want to encourage you. This 20 minutes a day is awesome. It is is absolute necessity but there are times and seasons in your life where there is an onslaught of lies that you may be believing about yourself onslaughts of temptation that you have got to get serious you've got to find the scriptures that address that lie and you've got to start speaking it out loud speaking it out loud and you will see the power of God unleash over your life the power of God, do something that only Jesus could do in that moment. And I'm just, by the grace of God, I can stand before you and say, we did it. We have victory. I won't see him again until I stand at that altar with him in two weeks. And we fought the enemy because Jesus is better. We would look at each other and say, I love you, but I love Jesus more. I love Jesus more. And it made us stronger as we could see. There's a battle going on around us, and we've got to fight it with the word of God. We've got to fight it with the word of God. Repent. Resist and rely. Renew. But ladies, my final my final word to you to keep you from destruction and to keep you on the path to your destiny is run. Everyone say the word run with me. Run. Turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Debbie, when you were sharing your story, I felt like the Lord said, you remember Hebrews 11? They believed God and it wasn't good stuff. And I felt like your name is written right up there. There's Elijah and in God's book, there's Debbie Stewart. And when he says in Hebrews 12, he said, we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. You're one of them. You're one of them. And standing in the middle of that is Jesus. And he's standing for you and he's standing with you and he is fighting this for you and he is better. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, see that's referring back to Hebrews 11 where it teaches us of these people who ran by faith. They pursued God. They believed God. They didn't detour. They didn't detour. They didn't detour. They didn't detour. Since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. 
fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This past fall, I was asked by a ministry I support in India to run a half marathon. I said a half marathon for um, a little girl that's been rescued out of a brothel and, and, and honor her. Now, I don't fashion myself or fancy myself a runner. I don't. But And, and 13.2 miles seems extraordinarily long to go anywhere with, without a car. I just feel like it's, it's, really, it's really not necessary in life. But then they throw the orphan card down, and you're like, okay, <laughs> uncle, it's an orphan. And so um, I agreed to, and I was stupid, and I started training in Houston in August <laughs> because the race is in October. And I could run a, a you know, a, I could run two miles when I started. Come on, whatever. So by the time the race comes around in October, I'm doing this thing. I'm doing this thing. I am stubborn. I am doing this thing. I've gotten up at 5 a.m. on Saturday mornings because I am running this race for the orphan. So I get up, and my um, fiancé came to support me. Now, he's built like he's from Kenya, okay? He's, like, tall and lanky, and I'm over here with my German hips and my, you know, my stocky self. And meanwhile, he's built all lanky and runner-like. He's just so excited and running, and I'm doing well. Like first couple miles, it's great. I'm running, I'm happy, I'm having a good time. I've got my little hill song on my iPod, and I'm having a good time. And then they didn't tell me this when I signed up. I'm running a half marathon. Well, meanwhile, some people are running 5Ks, some people are running 10Ks, some people run 15Ks, and they all get to detour while I have to keep running. And so I get to the five mile, I'm like, see y'all later, losers. And I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, I didn't say that. And so I keep running, I keep running. By mile seven, everything in my body was screaming at me. I hate you. It was so screaming at me. When I saw that 10K mark and I saw those runners peeling off, and I saw the little water station and the little granola bars and the little fruit roll-ups. There's fruit roll-ups and donuts. I, it was physically almost impossible not to go with them. I wanted to detour so desperately. And Justin sensed that I was getting weakened in my resolve. So he just started encouraging me, he started encouraging me. And when I told him to shut up, I didn't want to hear him talk anymore. Um, <laughs> he said, okay, I'm going to get in front of you. And I just want you to pace with me. I just want you to get in behind me, and I want you to pace with me. So he pulled right in front of me, and I was running, and I was running, and it was painful, and I wanted to stop, and I wanted to detour, and I just kept telling myself, if I can keep my eyes on him, I can get to the finish line. If I can keep my eyes on him, I can get to the finish line. And I'll tell you what, ladies, he ran me all the way in 13.2 miles into that finish line. The word of God tells us to fix your eyes on Jesus. You know how you're going to run. You know how you're going to avoid the detours. You know how you're going to fulfill your unique God-given destiny. You're going to run in such a way that your eyes are on Jesus. And every time the enemy comes up, the cry of your soul is going to be, Jesus is better. Jesus is better. I choose Jesus. Yes, my flesh might want to go here, but I'm choosing Jesus right now because Jesus is better. 